pleasure to be here. Always enjoy being in this house. So we'll be discussing stress tonight. Most of us, probably even I see some people rubbing their necks. Just getting here was a bit of stress. I certainly experienced that on the highway. I want to go back with you and talk about how we discovered stress, how the medical community found it, basically. A Hungarian physician named Hans Selly, 1936, he had moved to Canada and he was doing some research. A colleague down the hall had some ovarian extract that he thought would be a good idea if he injected it into some rats to see what would happen. He was a hormonal endocrine researcher. So he injected the rats with this ovarian extract over a period of months, and he did it every couple of days. At the end of several months, he decided to take a look at these rats to see what had happened. And what he found really shocked him. He found that they all had ulcers in their stomachs, peptic ulcers. They had hypertrophied, enlarged adrenal glands, and they had decreased immune tissues. Their spleen, their thymus were much decreased. And he said, Eureka, I have found this amazing ovarian extract that does amazing things to rats. Well, every good researcher, and Hans was a good researcher, has a control group that he injected them, but not with ovarian extract. He injected them with with salt water, with saline. Because every study, you've got to get the control group because we have to know, was it just a placebo effect? And what do you know, in the group he injected with saline, he found exactly the same thing. Hypertrophied adrenal glands, peptic ulcers, and an immune system that had shrunken. How could this be? And so he had this idea that he thought, well, maybe it has something to do with the fact that Every few days, I surprise these rats, I grab them, and I stick a needle into them. Mm. Mm. I wonder if I'm causing them some sort of irritation by this process. (laughs) And so he did some other studies. He put rats in, in the cold, and then he would put another group very in a, in a heated environment. And then he would make some of them swim for hours. So he was trying all of these different experiments, and he found the same thing with each one. And he was the one in 1936 who said, this is stress. Now, before that period, we had never used the word stress to describe anything medically. It was a materials term. We, we stress metals. But because he was a physician, he said, I have seen this in my patients. Some of them have a disease, but their disease symptoms now don't really, well, they go beyond what their disease actually is. And I think that they're experiencing stress. So he began to preach that stress will give you ulcers. I don't know if any of you have ever said, uh, you're giving me an ulcer, Hmm. or uh, this stress is killing me. If you've said something like that, you owe that to Hans Selle. He went around from 1936 on preaching, stress is toxic. It will kill you. An interesting side note is in the 40s and 50s, the tobacco companies actually paid him to say that cigarettes reduced stress. So he was sort of working both sides of that issue. 
the definition that Hans Selle gave stress was anything that puts a demand on the system, anything that puts a demand on your body, which subsequently gave rise to what we call the mismatch theory of stress. The mismatch theory of stress sort of comes out of evolutionary biology where we say it's because we were chased by lions and tigers on the savanna that we developed this unusual stress response. And now when we're carpooling, we get the same response. And we have this great stress response, but it's a mismatch. There's no lion. There's just a long line of cars. But our body responds as if there's a lion or a tiger, and so therefore it's this mismatch theory. In the last few years, that theory has really been doubt, put to doubt. It's been sort of replaced by what we call the new science of stress. And there's a book out uh, called The Upside of Stress by Kelly McGonigal, which uh, I think is a, a great book, and a lot of information I'm giving tonight will be from that source. Because I have thought for many years, in fact, I've even prayed about it, God, what is this stress response for? It doesn't seem to be serving me well. And the answer I got is that your stress is a signal to pray. It is telling you something is going on with you that you are out of control. So the, the, this mismatch theory now has been, um, it's been put sort of under question. And the reason is, if you go back to the original experiments, you would not describe that as, as stress. You would probably describe that more as, as torture. Mm -hmm. Right? This is, you know, and people who have, you know, do experience torture, do experience severe abuse, they can have, you know, that would fit. That experimental model would fit that. But for those of us, the most common stress is juggling family schedules. And, and, all, and the um, Harvard study, 2014, the most common stressor was juggling family schedules, carpooling, parenting. And so the studies don't seem to the mismatch theory doesn't really work out. The truth that I believe and what seems to be coming out of the research is that your stress response depends a lot on how you think about stress. And Hans Selle's research didn't really help us because it told us that stress is bad for you always. And if you believe that, you will respond in a way that essentially tries to distance yourself from it or tries to distract yourself from it. People that have that belief, or we'll call it a mindset, and a mindset is the filter through which you see life. It helps you make your decisions. It is your core beliefs. You may not be able to state them, but it's what you believe about life. And so if you believe that stress is bad, if your heart rate increases, this is killing me, I better do something to stop it, and you go get a drink of alcohol, or you, you start taking uh, pills to, to settle you down. If you believe that, uh, the research shows that actually stress is harmful to you. If you don't believe that, it can potentially be a benefit. And that's something I want to talk about tonight. So this, the stress that most of the researchers are producing when they do these rat tests, it is unpredictable. Um, it is completely devoid of meaning. There is no meaning to the rats for this. And I want you to start thinking about the things that cause you stress cause you stress because there's a lot of meaning associated with that issue. That family member, those finances, your health issue, a lot of meaning is associated with that. 
So we're talking about different types of stress, and, and what I'm hoping to lay out for you tonight is a way to transform your stress, which you may think of as bad for you, into something positive that your body will use positively. So those in the stress is harmful camp believe that it's depleting and it should be avoided. This is by far the most common mindset among not only Americans but worldwide because Hans Selle went worldwide with his message. He went to, he wrote more than 1,700 scientific articles. That is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous amount of production of scientific articles. If you believe that stress is actually enhancing, it actually will give you vitality. It will make you more creative. It can even improve your learning. And this is very, very important. Stress, if seen correctly, will improve your learning. You learn from stressful situations what you would or wouldn't do the next time. If you believe that stress is helpful to you, uh, you will accept the fact that stressful events are real and you will work toward a solution to them. You won't withdraw. You won't try to distract yourself or make them disappear. You will start having constructive ways to work toward that. You will see it as an opportunity to grow And a very important word I want you to remember is the word reframe. You will begin to reframe your stress instead of as a threat to you, you will reframe it as a challenge or an opportunity. And I believe that is the way that God wants us to see all of our threats, all of our problems. If we look in the scripture, that's what I read that God is an optimist. Uh, he wants us to see our, our world, our stress, our problems as opportunities for us to grow, for us to learn, and for us to move into relationship. Very interesting study was done with students they had them appear before a panel of three judges. And they had to give a five-minute speech on why they thought they would be good for uh, a student job, like a, a student advisor position. And these judges were programmed to give only negative feedback. They would cross their arms. They would roll their eyes. They would look down. They would do everything discouraging they could for these students who were trying to present their best self. The second second experiment was they had the students count backwards from 1,001 by 13s. (laughs) And if they missed one, the judges did the same thing. They had to start over. All, everything was discouraging. Which, as you could imagine for a student, this is a very stress-producing, which is exactly what the test was meant to do. One group of students, they said, really, um, stress you know, is, is bad for you, basically. Stress is, is tough on the body. The other group, they said, when you notice your heart rate increasing, that's a good thing. That shows that your body is rising to the occasion. It's rising to the challenge. Just, just go with it. They measured their heart rate, their cardiac output. Uh, they measured the amount of um, cortisol they produced, adrenaline they produced their, um, with their saliva. What they found was that both groups produced a fair amount of this cortisol. They were both stressed. 
But the group that they told stress is bad for you, they had a typical stress response, which means the blood pressure goes up, the arteries clamp down, and your cardiac output goes down. You are, we call it this fight or flight response. It's trying to get the blood away from the skin where an injury might occur. You're sort of uh, clamping everything down. And they were filming the students, and they, they really found them to be quite distressed and losing their train of thought. But the students that they told that the stress response is a good thing, their cardiac output went up. They were rated as having much better presentations as far as being a candidate for this job, and they were much more successful subtracting serial 13s from 1001. And that was a very important study. It showed that the way you think about stress affects your physiologic response, also your performance. And even your, your mood or your evaluation of how stressful was that event and how good of a job do you think you did. So all around the mindset, the change of mindset for these students affected the way they interpreted their, their surroundings and their circumstances. So the question is, does everyone respond to stress the uh, same way? So, for example, maybe you have a couple, and the couple is at a place where they typically go and they begin to discuss something, and then they just kind of go off the cliff. And now they're in a cognitive debate, and they're their stress level is going up, and they're probably not seeing their stress as a friend at that moment. Or maybe the parent with right. an adolescent that's working right. on an issue, and the parent sees the discussion, even though the adolescent sees the discussion as very negative and controlling, the parent is looking through the lens of, I have a dual responsibility, and that is to be the parent, and also try to, try to be a friend as well along the way. Those two scenarios might be very different. Would you not say? I would. Well, the most common response is fight or flight. Uh, you want to make the person or the problem go away. That's our typical response. Most people have that. There are two others, and we can talk a little bit more about those later. Uh, some people, depending on how you were raised, may have what we call a tend and befriend response. That means you're actually moved into relationship. You become more relational. And then there is what I would call the challenge response, where you see it not as fight or flight, but you see it as an opportunity, and you become more creative. Uh, you have more energy. You're more energetic. Uh, mm -hmm. And you actually uh, you, you are able to learn more. So there are a number of different responses. Most common, unfortunately, most of us have the uh, fight or flight response. So fight or flight is really not going to be helpful for relationships, and prayer is a relationship. So most of us find that we have a difficulty praying. Uh, we, have a, we have difficulty sort of engaging God or really anyone else, if we're honest, when we have this stress, when we have this fight or flight response. So... We can get into it a little bit later that with oxytocin, which is one of this bonding chemical, is actually released during stressful times more in some people than others, and that can help you to reach out and ask for help uh, from others. Hmm. I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, I was doing neurosurgery in Africa which many would consider a, a stressful event. Hmm. So I arrived, jet lag, was working some long hours, had really not found, you know, we tried to, to do a few operations in people. The tools were not very adequate. A woman came in who had a large epidural hematoma. It's a large blood clot. She'd gotten into a fight with her daughter, and her daughter hit her in the head with a, a two-by-four. Mm. And so I went to see her in the, uh, 
in the emergency room, and I looked around for that daughter in the two by four. Mm. I didn't see them, so I looked at the scan. It was a, a big clot. It was one of the biggest I'd ever seen. And so I expected the woman to be in a coma. Well, she wasn't. She was actually looking at me. She just couldn't speak, and she couldn't move her right arm. So she had this blood clot on the left side. So to me, this is a big emergency. But it's 5 o'clock. It's after 5 in the afternoon. And that's, that's hard to even get a, our operating crews to work, you know, to move quickly after 5. If you're in Africa, everything is very, very slow. And I've got this emergency. I've got finally someone I think I can save that is going to be helped by neurosurgery, and we've got to get this woman to the operating room. And so I'm running around trying to light fires under everybody, and they're drinking their tea and kind of looking at me. And I'm <laughs> finally, I wheel her down there to myself, and we get her on the table. And then, uh, you know, I said a prayer for her. And it took like two hours. So it's 7 o'clock before we started. It started at 5. Now it's 7 o'clock. We finally have her on the table, get her put to sleep. So we need to take this clot out, and I'll tell you how to do it in case you want to try this at home. <laughs> right. Now we're getting into trouble here. Right, so you shave okay. the left side of the head. You may say make an incision behind the hairline. It's called a reverse question mark all the way back. You come in front of the ear, drop it down because you want to save the, the blood supply to the skin. And so you then pull that skin flap forward. So to, to move that forward, I needed a tool called a, a periosteal elevator, something that scrapes this flap because the periosteum adheres to the bone. And so I asked for a periosteal elevator. The woman looks at me strangely and hands me something, and it looks like a butter knife. Mm, mm. And so I take the butter knife, and I just started to use it, and I thought, well, I can do brain surgery with a butter knife. I'm, I'm in Africa, and this is, this is going to be great. I, I, I'm so flexible. So I was able to get the flap off, but now I've still got to get through the bone. Well, I said, well, you know, do you have a drill? Well, they have a drill. It's a, a Black & Decker. <laughs> and so... We started putting holes. Are you having fun yet? Or was it, uh, were you having fun? <laughs> okay. Oh, I forgot to tell you. So I, I'm working with a surgery resident who is interested in, you know, if he doesn't, a neurosurgeon doesn't come out there very often. So when one comes, they get to do their neurosurgery rotation. So he was just excited as could be, wanted to drill the holes. So we put... We put a number of holes, five holes, about the size of a dessert plate, all around this flap of bone. The next thing we have to do is connect the, the holes. Well, normally we have a drill that just sort of zips between those. It's a side-cutting drill, and we just zip around, and we have the bone flap off in about 30 seconds. There's not one of those drills. They have something called the giggly saw. Giggly saw is not because neurosurgeons get so giggly when we get to take the bone off. It's named for Leonardo Giggly, who was an Italian obstetrician who used this to um, uh, cut through the, the, the pubic bone of women who, to enlarge their pubis to, uh, to help them have children that, that they were unable to deliver. So it's, a, it's something that is essentially a... It's like a, a bicycle chain. It is a... a welded metal, looks like a bicycle chain. There are handles on both ends, and you rub it back and forth like this, and it basically saws through the... It connects these two holes. Are right? we getting credit for medical school? By your yeah. yeah. That... <laughs> I love this story. So okay. I have... <laughs> we can tell. <laughs> so George starts working this giggly saw, and of course, I, I have to hold the woman's head. We have, here in the States, we have pins that pin the head, but no pins, so her head is bobbling back and forth. He's sawing this thing, and I said to George, uh, George, be careful when you come through the bone, because boom, the giggly saw flies up in the air, lands on the floor. George says, oops. I said, George, it's okay, we have another giggly saw. 
but you're doing neurosurgery, so don't say oops. We don't say oops when we do neurosurgery. <laughs> so we get the other giggly saw, and he's... So we have to put it down through one hole, across the surface of the, the brain, up through the other hole. He's, he's sawing away on the other hole, and it's very common if you are using this saw that you, instead of keeping your hands far apart, you start to put them closer together just to pull harder. I said, George, don't put your hands too close. Chink! The giggly saw broke. Oh. And George said, oops. <laughs> <laughs> and now I can feel this anger rising in me. And I can feel this stress. Because now it's nine o'clock at night. And I was expecting this to be a quick case. This would be a 30 minute surgery. And we've been at this four hours. I'm hungry. I'm angry, I'm lonely, and I'm tired. And some of you that have been in recovery programs know that that stands for HALT, <laughs> right? Don't do anything too quickly. Don't say anything or do anything because you're probably going to have to apologize for it. And so I was, as I was um, just so angry, and now I, I, I didn't know how I'm going to get the bone off. Part of it is that I'm, nobody else seems to care. I'm the only one that really cares about this woman, and it's their, you know, member of their country. And I don't feel that God's helping me. After all, I'm, I, I'm a missionary in Africa. I should be right at the top of the list of the people that God should be helping right now, and I'm not feeling it. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm really experiencing this, this anger uh, this is, isn't right. And as we're talking about stress, fight or flight, it makes us not relational. So, yes, I need God's help, but did, am I in a mood to even ask for it? No. Do I even feel like praying? No. Do I, you know, is anything about me feeling like, well, something else about prayer is it requires humility. And when we are angry, we get prideful. This shouldn't be happening to me. You're supposed to be helping me. We start judging, and often we start judging God. I think this is one of the commonest problems even with depression that we get into, and anxiety certainly leads to depression in many cases because we start saying, you should be doing this. Well, the truth is I've never, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not praying through this. I just said my prayer at the beginning and was expecting everything to go the way I wanted it to. And part of it is maybe some of you have noticed that you may be stressed because you are responsible. Here I am, the neurosurgeon in the country. I'm responsible as the neurosurgeon to be able to get the bone off. And I came all this way, thousands of miles, the opposite side of the world, and I cannot get the bone off this woman's head. Now I'm stuck. And I'm feeling maybe embarrassed, maybe awkward, something about that. And so I say, uh, we need to pray. Really, I needed to pray, but I said it like that. It seemed to help to the royal we. Mm-hmm. And so I said, you know, God... Uh, look, I'm stuck right now. I can't get the bone off this woman's head. I need some help. It wasn't a very nice prayer. It was really almost even a, an angry prayer. But what I want to say to you is you've got to start where you are. You've got to start where you are, not where you think you should be, not where the pastor is, not where Dr. Welch is. You've got to start where you are in that moment, in that situation, and say, I, this is the best prayer. Sometimes it's help. Uh, so I prayed that, and then I said, okay, what, what, what do we have to get this bone off? You know, we think about a chisel and this and this. Well, sure enough, George finds uh, a piece of um, suture, and he tied it on the end, and he said, I think we can use this little wire piece to pass under the, under the skull bone. 
I said, all right, George, whatever. I still wasn't in a, in a very good mood, so I said, go ahead and give it a try. And so he was able to try it and get this broken piece of saw under there. We put a clamp on, and we started sawing very slowly, and it took us 45 minutes, but we were able to get the bone off. And when that happened, I had this, it was a relief, and then I had this choice to just go on with the operation or to stop and say, let's just stop a moment and thank God. Hmm. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons I did not want to stop and thank God is because I prayed and God gave the solution to George. (laughs) I'm supposed to be the genius. What happened to that? (laughs) And so some of prayer is humility to say, Lord, whatever way you want to send your solution, I'm willing to take it. So we ended up, we got the bone off. Long story short, it was a very long operation. We finished at one o'clock in the morning and, you know, I walked outside in the, under the African sky and I said, God, thank you for helping me uh, get that get that bone off, and getting this clot out. On the next morning, the woman could talk; she was able to speak, um, and George was able to, you know, ask her if she had a relationship with God, and she did not. And he was able to to show her that through Jesus, her sins could be forgiven. Mm-hmm. And that was just a beautiful ending to a very difficult story that I was able to learn from because. I paused when I was starting to lose it. And I just encourage you to take that story for what it is. Sometimes a story is worth a lot more than all the data I can give you. So there you, there you have it. It's so important in, to stay relational. Stay relational. Because, because once we get the stress and we start getting angry and we start judging, it should be different and I shouldn't feel this pain and I shouldn't, you know, th- these people should be doing, you know, whatever. You've got your own stories. Everyone's got their mm-hmm. judgments that they start handing out. We are not relational. Our relational abilities go way down. So as we start to give thanks, mm-hmm. and one of the things I said uh, that evening with that woman was, God, thank you for this woman. You love her more than I do. Mm. I start getting, you know, start putting things where they belong. Whose responsibility is this? I'm doing the best I can, but I'm stuck. Um, But you love her more than I do. Uh, Oh, all of a sudden a new brain path opens up. Well, now the responsibility is in the right area. I'm here to do the best I can. Now let's get creative to figure out what what to do. So staying relational. So gratitude and thanksgiving is one of the best ways, maybe the easiest way, to start getting relational again when you are not relational with all of this stress. So giving thanks for anything around you. I usually start with my eyes if I can't think of anything to give thankf- mm-hmm. thanks for because some people can't see. Well, I can. God, I thank you for my eyes. Mm. You know, that's, that's when I'm not finding any, uh, any connection with God. Just start giving thanks for something that you have per- perhaps that you take for granted. I hadn't thought about it until you were talking about it, but Paul and Silas, when they were in prison, of course, they really didn't know what else to do, and so they just started to believe they should praise God. And we don't know exactly what they began to sing. We do believe they were singing some of the Psalms, and that is that my Lord is a fortress. Even though I'm afraid, I can still trust in Him. And in a way, when they began to sing praises... Uh, Of course, uh, I don't know if God got a little amused by it, but he shook that Mm -hmm. jail and opened it up. And, of course, the first person that came around to try to see where they were was the guard. He was ready to take his life, and then he realized that they were serving the God of the universe. So this idea of praise leads us back to relationship. You illustrated, I was watching you, you were illustrating how we begin to become prideful. You were describing you and your colleague. And there's a sense of pridefulness, I thought I heard you say, is I try to take charge of the situation. If you think about it, that's, that's the one thing that we tend to do well from early childhood into adulthood, and that is to individuate. Individuate means that I take charge of my world. It's like the two-year-old, mine, 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 right? I take charge. And so it's very natural for us to take charge. However, it can easily 
and quickly move into pride is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. And that means that I'm trying to take charge and I'm no longer in a relationship mode at that moment. Right. Um, the problem now is worth more than the person. And mm. when our problems become more valuable than the people and the relationships, uh, then you know something is off balance. That is not mm -hmm. the way God sees the world, that you know, people are worth more than things. And when that starts mm -hmm. changing, you can have a little light on your dashboard should go off to say, okay, something, I need to reorient my relationship with God or perhaps with others, mm -hmm. or I must be too stressed right now. One of their famous books in the history of written text, uh, not even close to the Bible, of course, but Martin Buber wrote a book called I and Thou. It's a very famous book. If you're a businessman or a businesswoman, it's in the annals of the business world. If you're in theater, it's in theater. If you're in psychology, you're in sociology, you start naming the various field, and that particular little book is in there because he said we either treat people as a thou that means they are special, they're unique, or an it. And it means that you move to the fact that they're an object. And the entire little book, when I purchased it, that shows how old I am. It was $2.25. That's what I paid for the book. I and Thou, Dr. Martin Buber, B-U-B-E-R. Very famous book that actually punctuates what you're suggesting here. The next question that we're tying into is, is the person has asked... There's a question, does stress cause illness? You talked a little bit about that early on, uh, not to the degree to which this question's raising it. So most of us believe that we have, that stress can cause us to be sick. Um, in fact, Hans Selle called it the sick syndrome. That was his initial uh, diagnosis, his initial name. So in the 80s, the English did this study they advertised people ages, I think, 18 to, to 35. They would give you a free two-week holiday in the countryside if you would agree to be in this study. And so they got a group of people, and they had an all-expense-paid trip. There was a catch. And the catch was that you had to first list how stressed you felt, and then they actually sprayed the cold virus up your nose. And there was a group they had uh, in their bathing suits that had gotten out of the pool, and they had them stand in a cold corridor. <laughs> I love this research. The other group they had walk around with wet socks trying to produce exactly what your mother would have told you never to do. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So what did they find? Do wet socks and not drying off uh, uh, and standing in the cold after swimming cause you to have a cold? They do not. Unless you are stressed. If you have... Those with stress had a three times higher chance of getting a cold. Hmm. It turned out about a third of the people that went on their free holiday ended up getting a cold. Hmm. So they spent their... Uh, Two-thirds of them actually had a good holiday, and one-third of them uh, ended up with a cold on a holiday. And that's where we get our idea that illness can be caused by stress. It was really from that study. Okay. Oh, one, oh, one little caveat, moderate exercise boosts the immune system enough that people who exercise moderately have less of a chance of getting sick or getting a cold. So if you, if you start to get sick, if you do a little bit of exercise every day, not hard exercise, you don't want to stress your immune system, but your immune system responds to moderate exercise. If you want to go for a walk, that's a good way to, to resist um, catching a cold. Give us some parameters, if you would, Dr. Levy, and that is the parameter of what would be good exercise. You said a walk, but are you talking a two-mile walk or a 30-mile walk? What are you talking about with... What, can you give us some parameters? It, well, it depends on where you are in your health. 
on your health journey. Yes. So it would be something that would, you know, your heart rate would get up a little bit. It, you wouldn't be panting, especially if you are sick already. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, exercise, very, very good for the brain. Exercise is good for any number of things. It helps your brain secrete um, brain-derived factors that help, help your brain cells grow. It's, it's like miracle grow for the brain. Exercise really helps um, in so many ways with dementia, with, um, with stress, with a lot of things. It, it really, I think, also exercise helps you realize that taking care of your body um, is good to do. It, it's an investment that you make. Uh, what we find, uh, I guess we have that, um, we can talk about, about aging, but exercise really delays aging significantly. So, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's helpful. I, by law, I cannot advise someone to exercise oh, okay. <laughs> with my license. I need a medical doctor. To, so I was really wanting to just put you on the spot to help, help some patients out here that are working on that. But anyway, that, here's a question that was being asked, and I see more stressed... I see more stress than others in my home. Do certain people naturally handle stress better than others? So I see more stressed than others in my home. Do certain people naturally handle stress better than others? Yes. Certain people naturally handle stress better. If you experienced a life-threatening illness in your childhood, uh, you will handle stress a little bit differently. You then have learned to ask others for help. You will have higher oxytocin, this bonding chemical, and you will reach out more naturally to others when you are under stress. For those of us that didn't have a life-threatening illness as a child, uh, who might have had some abuse in the home as a child, your tendency is going to be to fight or flight. You are going to handle stress typically by not trusting others Uh, by withdrawing and by engaging this fight or flight. Now, your response to this oxytocin chemical is also somewhat genetic, so some people genetically have a different response. If someone in the home doesn't have the same stress response as the other party, there are pros and cons to that. Because... Someone who doesn't really respond to stress, they're very, we call them stress resilient. They really don't show much reaction to it. The downside of that um, can be that they also don't really learn from stressful situations. Mm -hmm. They may allow the same thing to happen next time. It didn't stress them out. Whereas someone who responds with a stress response, like a fight or flight response, will tend to learn from that, try to make sure it doesn't happen again. Mm. Mm. Now, that person can also have more anxiety, which can lead to depression. So if you respond with this fight-or-flight response, you can have anxiety or depression. That can be a negative. The positive to someone who has a fight-or-flight response to stress can be that you become more compassionate you, you, you have experienced what that's like and you, you become more compassionate to others and you can also have more self-growth through that than someone that the stress doesn't bother. And it's, it's just worth emphasizing here that stress, I believe, is designed as a learning experience. Your brain wants to learn something through this. So if you just try to put it away or put it down or distract yourself or watch a movie and you don't start moving into it, now you may need to settle your nerves down for a bit, but eventually you want to move into this because you need to learn. You need to pray. You need to move. You need need to grow. Stress is an opportunity to help us grow. If we have this challenge opportunity mindset versus the mindset of, you know, this is terrible for me, I just need to make it go away, and, and I'm going to go isolate myself. So the, the first thing we want to do is to notice, you need to notice when you're in stress. Most of us don't even notice it till we're, we have said something that we never should have said. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've acted irrationally. 
And now we're thinking, oh, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. Um, and we have to go and try to do damage control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I'd love to happen here is even just to take a moment right now and to think for yourself, where do you feel stress in your body? A lot of people feel it in the chest. A lot of people feel it in the lungs, in the, in the throat, stomach. We know that the GI system is probably the most sensitive to stress. Again, those peptic ulcers that the rats had. Where do you feel it? Some people get gas or burping or bloating or all of these things because the GI system, your digestion, your um, acid secretion, very sensitive to stress. Where do you feel it? Some people feel it in the, in the temples. just want to just pause for a moment because I, I would love for this to be a little bit of a workshop. Hmm. To, so you're going to leave here knowing a little bit more about, about yourself. So let's just take a few seconds just to think about, make a note, where do I feel it? So that next time I'm going to be more aware that it's coming before I'm out of control. So with this, this next question, it's asking real specifically, when we think of stress, can stress make you gain weight? Can stress make you gain weight? When we get stressed, we crave carbs. Often, That's not good news. Often, a, not good. often a combination <laughs> of carbs and fat, which are things like ice cream. Uh, we just happen to love that combination when we get stressed. Mm. Sugars, cookies, muffins, rolls, cakes, uh, we love that stuff. Uh, so some of this, uh, and so you may be going to the refrigerator and have it open before you even realize why you're there. A lot of this is happening. It's a craving that's coming up, and... One of the things I want you to be is just more aware. Oh, hey, I'm getting stressed. I am not actually hungry. I'm at the refrigerator because I have stress. Mm. That will make you gain weight. And a, a lot of our weight problems, I'm, I'm convinced, worldwide now, have to do with emotional eating. We, we have not been taught how to handle stress properly. And we were taught, usually in our family of origin... This is the way we handle stress. We, we eat and smile and pretend that the problem doesn't exist. And so people are trained that way. Mm. Uh, here, have some food. It, it'll have some ice cream. It'll go away. A very interesting study was done regarding your mindset. And this is an interesting thing. How you think about exercise really does change what would happen to your body. A Harvard researcher, Alia Crum, took this group of housekeepers at hotels. Now, typically, you burn 300 calories an hour cleaning house. You burn 100 calories an hour sitting at your computer. But if you would talk to a housekeeper at a hotel or look at a housekeeper, they're bodies typically look as if they are sedentary. Their blood pressure, their waist-to-hip ratio, their body fat, their weight, they look as if they don't do any exercise at all. So Alia Crum went in and took this group of hotel workers, and four of the, in four hotels she went in and she told them, do you know that your house cleaning actually meets the Surgeon General's requirements for daily exercise. And she noticed that uh, she told them in a 15-minute talk, when you vacuum, you burn this many calories. When you clean a bathroom, you burn this many calories. When you're pushing that load of towels, this is how many calories you're burning. And she put up a, a sign in their lounge to remind them. She did that in... She did that in four hotels. In three hotels, she just went in and gave them a talk about how exercise is good for you. At the end of a month, she compared the two groups. The group that had now this idea that what they were doing daily was actually exercise had lost weight. Hmm. She didn't speak at all about their food or about diet. They'd lost weight. Waist-to-hip ratio had improved 
their blood pressure was down, and they said that they enjoyed their job more. So this is just an illustration to tie in weight and how you think about your job or stress or exercise really, really makes a difference. Wow. That's very fascinating. And again, it's back to your perspective. I think you talked about that early on in my notes as I'm taking notes. Um, you said stress is anything that puts demand on the body, but you also talked about, of course, stress is a signal to pray, um, but you talked about how important how you think about stress, those core beliefs, that mindset is very important, kind of going into that, that curiosity. With our time left, I have several other questions that might be helpful. You did talk about how stress slows down aging. Can stress make you age faster, however? Can stress make you age faster? If you have a positive view of aging, so we're just talking about how these women think about their job, how you think about growing old makes a huge difference. It actually, if you have a positive view of aging, that aging is a good thing, in other words, you are wise, capable, that will add, that will add eight years to your life. They did, a, they did a study that showed if you, people who had heart attacks, recovered faster if they believe that people that age are wise and capable versus them being useless or stuck in their ways, things like that. So the way you, uh, you think about aging makes a, a big difference. And it also, what you project into the future, because it makes sense that if you think that aging is a good thing, and by the way, the research shows that as people age, they, their mood becomes better. You become happier as you age. Most people don't believe that, but that's actually what the research shows. If you believe that aging is a good thing, you naturally would exercise or do things to make your future self better. Most of us put a lot of stuff on our future self. Oh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take care of that. Uh, because I'll be so much wiser and, um, and thinner then. <laughs> but the decisions you're making today are affecting who you are in 10 years and that future self. And so as you, as you start thinking about your future self as a real person, and I would even recommend as a, a little homework for you to write a letter to your future self mm -hmm. and... You know, treat your future self as a real person to be kind to your future self in the things you put in your mouth, in the exercise that you do. It will, it will help you sort of connect to, yes, I believe aging is a good thing. I'm becoming wiser. And I'm also making those thousand little decisions to help me become wiser um, and not relying on just some wisdom to suddenly land on me when my hair is gray. Mine's already gray, but anyway, so thank you. Is it, this next question, very, very helpful. Is it more stressful to live in USA than, than other places? So is it really more stressful, would you say, living here than other places? Well, they surveyed 21, 121 different countries, and what they found was that the, they asked this question, did you experience a high degree of stress yesterday? Did you experience a high degree of stress yesterday? Average response of all the countries, 33% of people said yes. Yesterday was a stressful day. So 33% is the average. The United States, 43%. The lowest was Mauritania and Africa, 5%. What this research also showed was yes, the United States has more than average stress, but that stress and happiness actually went together. Having a stressful life also means having a meaningful life. Hmm. 
as I said earlier, the reason you're stressed is because it means something to you. Your project, your relationships, your business, if you're an entrepreneur, yes. You want that. Are you stressed? Yes. Is your life meaningful? Yes. You have an 18, someone 18 or under in your house. Are you stressed? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I do. <laughs> you also statistically will laugh more and have more joy in your house because you have someone under 18. So I want you just, in, in the moments we have left, and you can even write this down, as you are reframing your stress, I want you to say, how is this stressful event meaningful in my life? And if it were taken away, would I want it back? In most cases, you'd say yes. And I want you to reframe your stress by looking at it and then asking God for God's input. God, what are you up to here? He's always up to something good because he is always good. Mm -hmm. And so reframing stress how is this meaningful to me? And even writing out your values and how meaningful that is, uh, studies have shown very, very helpful for your stress management, journaling, and, and talking about the meaning and the values you have. And that's why this means so much, because it's one of your values to have good relationships or your, uh, your business, whatever it is. So I think that's where we're spread out of time. I love that, for that word, reframing, is so important. It's sort of like having a beautiful picture of the ocean, and you have a frame around it, and you've looked at that picture many, to many times, and you see the ocean, and then all of a sudden you take this different frame and put around it, and all of a sudden, I never saw those seagulls over here and that green grass that's growing over here next to the ocean. You begin to see brand new things. So we're going to give them about a minute maybe to do that? Yeah, I just remember a, meaning, a meaningful life is a stressful life. It's just the way, the, the way it works mm -hmm. out. Uh, but how you handle that, things like meditation are also helpful. I've got some resources on my website about breathing and some meditations that, uh, that can be uh, accessed there. And that, that is drdlevy.com. drdlevy.com. Just free audio stream meditations that I've uh, put on there, scriptural meditations with some breathing exercises to, uh, to help calm us if we need to. Uh, and then... Once we're calm, you can it's more easily think about what the meaning is of your stress. But yeah, let's take a minute just right now just to do a little... Um, we're, find that meaning in your stress so that when you leave here, you are, you are reframing your stress. Everyone in here, I'd love to do that now. We'll take a minute. Due to time, I've given you about 30 seconds, but due to time, we have limitations that um, it's wonderful to write this down. Uh, research has shown that you can think about something and you may remember 20%. You think about it and write it down, it can move up to approximately 80% of accomplishing it. So there's something remarkable about writing something down uh, and, that and, does And something. telling someone about it. And telling someone about it. Even more. Yes, so even if, more. if you go out and share something you learned tonight with someone, it's helping you and, and them hopefully too. But you, wow, this was really good. You repeat it and you start that brain process. So by all means, share and write. Please join me in thanking Dr. David Levy for joining us this evening. Thank you, Thank you David. Pleasure. Thank you, sir. Pleasure.